Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. We have an opening song first. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us ever walk with Jesus. To seek the depths of his love. To behold the gift of his forgiveness. To gaze upon the heights of his grace. To marvel at the magnitude of his mercy. We walk with Jesus to the God of Gethsemane, where he is betrayed by Judas and arrested by the Jews, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Faithful Lord, with me abide, I shall follow the way of God. All be seated. The first reading, the Holy Gospel, from Matthew 26, 47 through 56. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels. 
But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Here, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Right now we're doing the Passion, the series sermon of the season of Lent. 3-3 three, three is Gethsemane. When sailors describe a storm that no one can escape, they, have, they often call it a perfect storm. Not perfect in the sense of ideal, but perfect in the sense of its combining factors. Combining factors like hurricane force winds and a cold front and rain and a high sea, high tide. The hurricane force winds alone would be impossible. But hurricane force winds and a cold front and rain and a high tide, a perfect storm. We don't need to be sailors to experience a perfect storm. All we need is a layoff and a recession and a child going away to college, a disease and a divorce and a parent with dementia, a relationship breakup and a college rejection letter and a C in calculus. We can usually handle one challenge, but two or three or four at a time, a bomb cyclone and a polar vortex, gale force winds and thunderstorms and hail. We're in a, a series is called Places of the Passion. Today we walk with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a place of a perfect storm, betrayal and an arrest and an assault and desertion, all leading to death by crucifixion. The crowd collects. While Christ was still speaking, Jesus, Judas came one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Matthew didn't mention Romans. That's because Romans wouldn't come into the picture until the next day. That's when they would mock him, flog him, and crucify Jesus. The crowd that collects, collects here is a crowd of Jews, the chief priests, who control the temple and elders, who are rulers of the setting, the Jewish Senate of, the, of 70. This is like the Supreme Court and the Congress sending the FBI to arrest you. Who's leading the Jewish pros with so much force, firepower and muscle? Judas. And what is Judas up to? Betrayal. Every time we celebrate Holy Communion, we hear the words, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed. This is that night. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to, Je to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus to him, Friend, do what you came to do. The Jews posed wouldn't be able to we we'll be able to recognize Jesus tonight. Jesus, therefore, gives him a sign, a greeting, and a kiss. In Matthew's Gospel, the term friend, who appears in Matthew 20, 13, to describe a person in a parable who rejects grace from other people. It also comes in Matthew 22, 12, to describe a person in a parable who isn't wearing a wedding garment. A friend, therefore, is a friend in name only. This is Judas. The chaos commences. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Matthew 26, 51, John's Gospel tells us it was Peter who drew his sword, that the slave's name was Malchus, and Peter cut off Malchus's right ear. The crowd collects and the chaos commences. It's a perfect storm. Are you bouncing up and down in a perfect storm? Are you doing everything you can to survive? Have you battened down the hatches, lowered the anchor, col collect, uh, consulted the bank, changed your diet, called an attorney, tightened your budget, gone into counseling or rehab or therapy, yet the sea still is churning and the waves are still coming? Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Why? The control is clear. Whose control? Christ's control. It's very clear. Judas and the Jews appear to be running things. Let me account the words of here. Jesus is currently the one in control. How so? Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. 
Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? The control is clear. When his enemies come, Christ goes out to meet them. When Judas approaches, Christ doesn't run. When Peter strikes Malchus, Christ commanded Peter to put his sword away. Jesus says in John 10:18, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Through the powers of darkness, rise against him. Full throttle, Christ is in control. He could ask his father for 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. There are 6,000 men in one Roman legion. Do the math. 12 times 6,000 equals 72,000 angels. Christ doesn't need 72,000 angels because Christ is in absolute control. During World War II, psychologists <coughs> compared ground troops with fighter pilots. They determined that after six days of continued combat, the anxiety of ground troop was off the charts. After six days, though, an astonishing 93% of fighter pilots were happy and at peace. Why is that? The fighter pilots had control. They had their hands on the throttle. Ground troops, on the other hand, felt forlorn and helpless. They could have just as easily been killed standing still or running away. What's the point? Popular wisdom tells us always to control. We don't need a war to prove it. All we need is a backup on the intimate inter, uh, a backup on the interstate highway. A team of German researchers recently found that a traffic jam triples our chances of a heart attack. That makes sense because in slow traffic we lose control. That's why popular wisdom repeatedly tells us always seek control. So what's the plan when a perfect storm hits? Always seek control. Never board a plane without a parachute. Never leave the house without a gas mask. Never step on a crack unless you break your mother's back. That's it. Face every storm by taking control. There's only one problem. With this popular wisdom, it doesn't work. Would you like something that does work when, you are, when you're in a perfect storm? Rather than seek control, relinquish control. Give it all up. Let go. Resign as CEO of the universe. Give your entire mess to Jesus. Look what Mark 41, or 4, 41 says. Even the wind that the waves obey him. Christ's control is clear. The calm is contagious. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. All this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Christ is calm because he trusts the scriptures. The scriptures have predicted all of these events. Scriptures like Zechariah 11:12, They weighed out of my wages 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 12:10, They will look on me, not on him who they have pierced. Zechariah 13, 7. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. In a Peanuts comic strip, Lucy was struggling with her Sunday school memory verse. Finally, she says, maybe it's a verse from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation? The scriptures are a book of Revelation. They help us revelate who is really in control. Christ is in control of sin and forgiveness and forgives every last one of them. Christ is in control of our prayers. He answers them according to his loving plan. Christ is in control of our heavy burdens. He takes them all to the cross. When parents send their children to a camp, they often have to sign a form that asks, who is the irresponsible party? If Johnny breaks his arm or Susie gets the measles, who is the responsible party? So a parent signs their name. Christ signed his name for us, and he wore it on his own, and wrote it in his own blood. When the perfect storm hits, Jesus is the responsible party, not us. It's his job to see us through. Christ is a shepherd, we are the sheep. Christ is a bridegroom, we are the bride. Christ is a rabbi, we are his disciples. One of these things is happening in our lives right now. We are either handling a perfect storm, or we are in a perfect storm, or we are just went through a perfect storm. No matter what, we don't have to become hopeless or anxious or faithless. We can stay calm. Why? In a perfect storm, Jesus delivers perfect peace. Amen. Onward, Christians. Footsteps tendering. Pilgrims here. Our home above. 
full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's bidding. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, you, you haven't promised us a stormless life. You don't offer quick fix or shallow solution, but you do promise perfect peace in the midst of whatever happened. Lord, in your mercy, grant us your peace. Heavenly Father, when we were out of the bootstraps to pull up, come to the end of our ropes and feel like quitting. You are with us and for us. Thank you for being a father who will never forget or abandon us in our storm. Thank you for working all things together for the good of those who love you. Lord, in your mercy, grant us your peace. Heavenly Father, thank you for your perfect peace, a peace perfectly suited for the moment. Our calling is not to take control, but to mine the riches of the gospel and never lose sight of your wonderful love. You are the rock that is the highest, higher than us, the rock of refuge, the rock of ages. Lord, in your mercy, grant us so peace. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Anchor us in hope, strengthen us in grace, and fortify us with absolute courage. Jesus, let me live in thee, life eternal grant to me. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trust us against us. He is us not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor, and give you peace. Amen. Amen.